I'm about to record my video showing that according to the standards Muslims use when they claim that someone has been cursed by Allah, Muhammad was cursed by Allah like no one else in history has ever been cursed by Allah. But it's kind of depressing going through Muhammad's horrible life, so I decided to make a more light-hearted video first. I've still got Nabil Qureshi's written defenses of Muhammad from when Nabil was still a Muslim, and I thought it might be fun to share some of them. It would have been more fun if I had had him read them a year or two ago so that he could have responded to his own arguments, a kind of Muslim Nabil versus Christian Nabil debate. But I didn't know how little time he had left, so we'll have to see what we think of these responses ourselves. In this video, we'll look at Nabil's defense of Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. To give you the context of Nabil's defense, this was August of 2004, a year before he became a Christian. Nabil was about to start med school, and he had recently given a presentation at Mike Lacona's house, yes, the Mike Lacona's house, on Muhammad's miraculous scientific insights and predictions. We discussed Nabil's arguments at the meeting, and sometime later, I uh, started looking up the passages he had quoted and sending him messages pointing out what the passages were really saying. Eventually, I sent a document to the rest of the group drawing attention to some of the absurdities in the sources Nabil was quoting. One of the criticisms I raised was Muhammad's relationship with Aisha. How could someone who's going to medical school believe that it's okay for a grown man to have sex with a nine-year-old girl? I would brought this up with Nabil before, but I wanted to see what other people in the group thought of his response. And here's his response. Nabil highlights the hadith I quoted from Sahih al-Bukhari. The hadith reads, Narrated Aisha, The Prophet engaged me when I was a girl of six years. We went to Medina and stayed at the home of Bani al-Harith bin Khazraj. Then I got ill, and my hair fell down. Later on, my hair grew again, and my mother, Umm Rahman, came to me while I was playing in a swing with some of my girlfriends. She called me, and I went to her, not knowing what she wanted to do to me. She caught me by the hand and made me stand at the door of the house. I was breathless then, and when my breathing became all right, she took some water and rubbed my face and head with it. Then she took me into the house. There in the house I saw some Ansari women, who said, Best wishes and Allah's blessing and a good luck. Then she entrusted me to them, and they prepared me for the marriage. Unexpectedly, Allah's apostle came to me in the forenoon, and my mother handed me over to him, and at that time I was a girl of nine years of age. So this is one of many hadiths which state that Aisha was nine years old when she was handed over to Muhammad so that he could consummate the marriage. How is Nabil going to respond? Yes, she was married at nine. Pause right there. Nabil acknowledges that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. Why is this important? Well, there are lots of Muslims who deny any facts they don't like. If you tell them something they don't like about Muhammad, they'll call you a liar. If you show them the Islamic source that proves what you're telling them, they'll say that you printed a fake version of that source yourself in order to deceive them. And they'll call you a Jew. When it comes to the age of Aisha, these Muslims will throw out dozens of crystal clear so-called authentic narrations that say that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. And they'll insist that Contrary to what all of their earliest, most respected sources claim, Aisha was actually much older than nine. If you ask for an authentic Muslim source that says that Aisha was a teenager when Muhammad first climbed on top of her, they won't give you a reference from the Quran or from Sahih al-Bukhari or from Sahih Muslim. Instead, they'll give you a link to some lame internet article which pieces together 
a bunch of circumstantial details from various sources, lies about what's in those sources, and then asserts that because of this convoluted collection of irrelevant details and outright lies, Aisha must have been much older than nine. There are lots of Muslims who will take this route, denying the clearest hadiths in their most trusted collections, all because the things we read about their prophet in their most trusted collections are, let's face it, humiliating. Nabil, to his credit, didn't take that route. He admitted that Aisha was nine. That's important. Let's continue. Yes, she was married at nine. Why did they wait until she was nine years old? Why not wait until she was 13? Why not wait until she was 16? Why wait at all? The Prophet has asserted that a girl who has started menstruation is eligible for marriage, and not only is she eligible, but it is suggested for girls to get married if there are no reasons otherwise. In today's day and age, there are plenty of reasons otherwise. Women are still being educated. The world has advanced to a point where a girl is not ready to get married until later in life, etc. Many girls have menarche at young ages. The age of nine is not that unusual. My sister tells me that she has friends that first menstruated at that age. Thus, it is not so strange to reach adulthood early, early by our standards, keep in mind, and with adulthood comes marriage. What's wrong with this response? It might be easier to ask what isn't wrong with this response, because apart from admitting that Aisha was nine years old, everything is wrong. According to Nabil, Muhammad said that a girl who has started menstruation is eligible for marriage. Muhammad actually claimed that even prepubescent girls are eligible for marriage, since Surah 65 verse 4 of the Quran lays down guidelines on how to divorce prepubescent girls after having sex with them. Nabil claims that Aisha had reached puberty by the time Muhammad had sex with her. Yet we know that she hadn't reached puberty because she was still playing with dolls, and girls who had reached puberty weren't allowed to play with dolls. Sahih Muslim 3481. It was narrated from Aisha that the Prophet married her when she was seven years old, and she was taken to him as a bride when she was nine years old, and she took her dolls with her. He died when she was 18 years old. Sahih al-Bukhari, 6130. Narrated Aisha, I used to play with the dolls in the presence of the Prophet, and my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's Messenger used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves but the Prophet would call them to join and play with me. The playing with the dolls and similar images is forbidden, but it was allowed for Aisha at that time, as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Aisha was allowed to play with dolls in the presence of her husband, who was in his 50s, because she was a little girl who hadn't reached puberty. Nabil suggests that Muhammad waited until Aisha was nine years old to have sex with her because he was waiting for her to reach puberty. But we've seen that she hadn't reached puberty, so why did Muhammad wait until she was nine years old to have sex with her? I'd say we already saw the answer in a passage we read. Aisha said that after her marriage was arranged, she got sick and her hair fell out. So Aisha had some sort of childhood illness. Muhammad waited until her hair grew back. Nabil asserts that once a girl has reached puberty, she's an adult. Now, Nabil was on his way to medical school. He was president of the Pre-Med Honors Society in college. I took several science classes with him. Didn't Nabil know that puberty is a process that takes several years? And that menarche is simply a sign that the process has begun? And that a nine-year-old girl isn't actually an adult? Her hips haven't widened? That takes a while. Other physical changes take years? Did Nabil really believe this revolting Islamic mantra Old enough to bleed, old enough to breed? 
Nabil understood how puberty works, so why was he pretending that a nine-year-old girl is an adult? Because his allegiance to Muhammad forced him to pretend that a nine-year-old girl playing on a swing, playing with dolls, is no different from a grown woman. This is what belief in Muhammad does to people. Nabil continues, You may argue, well, why did he have to marry her? Why couldn't someone else do it? If you knew more than what you chose to learn, where are you getting these arguments from anyway, you would have learned more history about the revered Aisha. Aisha was engaged from a young age to a friend of her father's. The practice of engagement even before birth is not an unusual thing. The child has only to accept at the time of puberty and it becomes official. If he or she does not accept, then the marriage cannot continue. Anyway, her fiancé had not embraced Islam. As he realized how close Abu Bakr, Aisha's father, was to the Prophet, he decided he did not want to marry her. A broken engagement is usually somewhat disgraceful, not out of religious reasons, but out of cultural tendencies. To quell any rumors and dissolve any disgrace from his friend and his friend's daughter, the Prophet offered to marry her. This is not to say that the marriage was out of pity, but there was more motivation than, hey, I'd like to marry her. So Aisha's fiancé, Jubair ibn Mutim, who was a pagan, decided not to marry her because she was a Muslimah. This rejection would have been embarrassing for Aisha and her father, so Muhammad, in a spirit of selfless concern for his friend Abu Bakr and his daughter Aisha, decided that he would restore their honor by having sex with Aisha. What a guy. Nabil's explanation here doesn't line up very well with what we read in the Muslim sources, but let's run with it. According to Surah 33, verse 21 of the Quran, Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. Now, think about the people involved in this story. We've got Muhammad, the seal of the prophets and pattern of conduct for Muslims. We've got Abu Bakr, Muhammad's closest companion and the first of the rightly guided caliphs. And we've got Aisha, who's called the mother of the faithful in Islam. What life lessons can we learn here? What's the takeaway? for Muslims. Well, if you're a Muslim and your best friend has a little daughter and he's already arranged her marriage to some pagan, but the pagan is having second thoughts, you should imitate Muhammad and swoop in and rescue the girl by marrying her when she's six or seven and having sex with her when she's only nine. Could you imagine someone using this defense in court? Muhammad ibn Abdullah, you've been charged with child marriage, multiple counts of child molestation, multiple counts of aggravated sexual abuse, multiple counts of fondling a child under the age of 10, and multiple counts of making your child bride clean your semen stains, which is just gross. How do you plead? Not guilty, you filthy kafir judge. Explain your actions to the court. Well, my best friend was in a bit of a bind. He had arranged a typical child marriage, marrying off a little girl to a much older man. But the man started getting cold feet. So, good friend that I am, I took the prepubescent little girl for myself and had lots and lots of sex with her. Totally normal in my religion. I hereby sentence you to one jillion years in prison. Will I need to register as a sex offender when I get out? I said one jillion years in prison. Next case. May I please switch to a Sharia court where the judges know that, according to Allah, having sex with prepubescent little girls is perfectly acceptable. Nabil was an extremely intelligent young man. Could he continue believing that his prophet had some really good reason for climbing on top of a girl too young for a bra, a girl young enough to be his great-granddaughter? No, he could believe it for a while, but that's the sort of thing that keeps coming back to haunt your mind, especially when you're friends with someone like me. And a year later, he was a Christian. I bring this up because we need to be aware of some typical stages in our interactions with Muslims. 
The first stage is what we might call the ignorance stage. Muslims rarely know what's in their sources, so we need to be the ones who help them out of that stage of ignorance. Their leaders want to keep them in a state of ignorance. We want them to escape the ignorance. So we tell them what their sources say about Muhammad, and this pushes them into stage two, the denial stage. Stop lying about my prophet. He never had sex with a little girl. That's a lie made up by Jews. After we take them through their sources, Muslims eventually reach the excuse stage. Well, yes, our prophet had sex with a little girl, but it was for a really good cause. He had to put his penis in her because it was the only way to rescue her from embarrassment. The excuse stage can continue indefinitely, and when we think about different facts about Muhammad, most Muslims are stuck in one of these three stages. They're either ignorant of what Muhammad did, or they're denying what he did, or they're excusing what he did. Our goal is to help our Muslim friends reach the fourth stage, the realization stage. This is when a light finally turns on and it finally hits them. Wait a minute. Why am I defending Muhammad? I'm defending Muhammad because my leaders convinced me when I was in a state of total ignorance and was therefore completely incapable of making an informed decision that Muhammad is the greatest man in history. But now that I've started learning about some of the awful facts about Muhammad from David Wood, since Muslim scholars never wanted me to know about them, I keep trying to justify Muhammad's actions and to reconcile them with my belief that he's the greatest man in history. But my justifications are absurd. Muhammad did some of the worst things a human being can possibly do, and I'm defending him. And because people like me are defending him, these practices persist to this day in the Muslim world, a place that can never develop morally because we've taken Muhammad as our pattern of conduct. Maybe instead of gullibly believing what my leaders say, I should be reevaluating my belief that Muhammad's the greatest man in history. And that's when they're on their way out of Islam. Of course, they'll only get to stage four if we, the people who love them and want them to know the truth, are relentless in studying their sources and sharing what we find. Now, back to Allah's merciless curse on Muhammad. 